Good afternoon. Today's discussion will be on gallbladder diseases. We'll predominantly focus our discussion on biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, ascending cholangitis and gallstone pancreatitis. Today's presentation has been conducted and organised by myself, Dr. Mehul Patel, and my colleague, Dr. Amanda Shabana. Uh, we are both senior house officers for the Department of General Surgery at the John Radcliffe Hospital. So let's begin. So let's first start by discussing the anatomy of the biliary tree and um, the, just the general anatomy really. So the gallbladder sits within the gallbladder fossa, which is located on the liver, liver bed. And as we know, bile is produced by hepatocytes in the liver. The, the bile produced within the liver itself drains through bile canaliculis. And um, they then go and drain into what's known as the right and left hepatic ducts. Once it leaves the liver, the right and left hepatic ducts then uh, fuse together to form what's known as the common hepatic duct, the CHD. That then goes on and um, uh, fuses with the cystic duct. Now the cystic duct comes, from di comes directly from the gallbladder itself. And the fusion of the two allows for bile to, be, to enter and leave the gallbladder directly. Further down, the two then, uh, well, the two fuse together to form what's known as the common bile duct, the CBD. The common bile duct has a long passage down towards the duodenum and towards the end of it, towards the end of its passage, it fuses with the major pancreatic duct, which comes to the pancreas, to then drain directly into the duodenum. And uh, when they fuse, they form what is known as the ampulla vata, and they drain directly into the major papilla uh, located in the duodenum. <clears throat> now, the fusion, of course, allows us to drain both bile and pancreatic juices directly into the gut and therefore digest food. So let's discuss the physiology behind this. So the function of the gallbladder itself is purely, it's like a bag in essence, it's, 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 it's there to store and to concentrate the bile. Now what is bile? Bile is a, is, is a fluid composed of several components. For example, it, can, it contains cholesterol, bile acids, bilirubin, water, phospholipids, and ions. Now, how do we get bile from the gallbladder to, to the duodenum? This is known as the neurohumoral response, and this occurs when we eat food, or as mentioned on the slide, during gustation. So what happens is the neurohumoral response uh, stimulates itself uh, when we're eating food, and it triggers these enteroendocrine cells, known as eye cells, which are found in the duodenum and the jejunum, and they secrete a hormone known as CCK, uh, cholecystokinin, which then goes in the bloodstream and causes the gallbladder to contract and therefore releases bile directly out of the gallbladder through these ducts uh, directly into the duodenum. So let's discuss the pathophysiology behind gallstones. So whenever any of these components of bile, as mentioned earlier, bilirubin or cholesterol, etc., etc., when they supersaturate, what, what that means is when the level of this specific component becomes greater than the others, that's no supersaturation. And that then forms a bile, uh, then, that then forms a gallstone composed of that com component. So in this lecture, we'll discuss two main forms of gallstones. This includes cholesterol stones and pigment stones. Cholesterol stones form when cholesterol supersaturates in essence, and it composes of 80% of all gallstones. There are risk factors involved in forming cholesterol stones, and those are known as the four Fs, which include being female, being 40, being fertile, and being fat, obese women, okay? Now, pigment stones, which compose of 20%, are made up of calcium bilirubinate, and they're often caused by hemolysis, acute hemolysis, for example, um, you know, acute hemolytic, uh, hemolytic anemias. The level of bilirubin rises, it supersaturates within the bile, within the bile and causes pigment stones. So let's discuss the first pathology known as biliary colic. So think, to think about it, we have now formed a gallstone within the gallbladder. Whenever we eat, the gallbladder contracts and we've got a stone there. So whenever we get contraction of the gallbladder, this stone sometimes lodges itself within the neck of the gallbladder. And whenever there's a blockage, you're gonna get a bit of distension and a bit of backflow and there's no passage of this bile out of the gallbladder. This is what causes the pain. So this is known as biliary colic because it occurs after meals when the gallbladder contracts and the, and the gallstone becomes lodged. 
what what is no, what is worth mentioning here is that during biliary colic, the presentation occurs uh, predominantly in the right upper quadrant. So the pain occurs in the right upper quadrant after meals, and it can radiate up towards the shoulder tip as well. And it lasts for about one to three hours, and then it subsides. It's important to note that there's no inflammation of the gallbladder during biliary colic. Therefore, you shouldn't be expecting a patient to present with any fevers, vigors, or chills. And when you take bloods on the patient, there should be no raised inflammatory markers, which includes having a normal white blood cell count and a normal C-reactive protein. On a physical examination, you expect a tender right upper quadrant, and they're known to be Murphy's negative. So what is Murphy's sign? Murphy's sign is when you palpate the upright upper quadrant during, during inspiration, and they have inspiratory arrest. It's important to note that this can only be positive if they have inspiratory rest upon right upper quadrant palpation on the right side of their tummy, but they're also negative on the left side. So let's discuss acute cholecystitis. Acute cholecystitis is pretty much biliary colic. However, the difference being there is active inflammation here and also the pain is constant. So in essence, we get in essence, recurrent episodes of biliary colic may cause acute cholecystitis. And in this case, the gallstone becomes lodged in the neck of the gallbladder or the cystic ducts are further along the pathway. Now this blockage then causes an infection behind it <clears throat> and therefore causing inflammation of the wall of the gallbladder. Physically and um, well, physically speaking, the patient usually presents with pain following meals in the right upper quadrant, but also um, they can present with a constant right upper quadrant pain too. They also have fevers. They also can experience some chills and rigors. And when you take bloods, you expect a raised inflammatory marker, which includes white blood cell counts and CRP. In some cases, they may, there, may, there may also be some derangement in the liver function tests, which include uh, alanine transferase, aspartate transferase, and ALK phosphatase. When you lay your hand on the patient, you should expect a tender right upper quadrant, and they should be what's known as Murphy's positive now, which is what we discussed on the previous slide. Now let's talk about the next pathology known as acute, uh, which, which is known as ascending cholangitis. This occurs when that stone we discussed earlier moves further down the tract in essence. So it's no longer lodged in just the neck of the gallbladder, no longer lodged just in the cystic duct, but finds its way down to the common bile duct. Now behind any obstruction, you often see an infection. And this is what ascending cholangitis is, an infection of the entire biliary tree, which includes a CBD, the common bile duct, includes a cystic duct and includes the gallbladder and in some cases can include the common hepatic duct too. The patient presents with pain in the right upper quadrant and often in the epigastric region too. Now it's worth mentioning um, Charcot's triad here. So when the patient presents, it's, it's, it, it's ideal to look out for Charcot's triad, which includes the signs and symptoms of fever, abdominal pain and jaundice. The reason they become jaundiced here is because the stone is now blocked further down the pathway, down to the CBD, the common bile duct. And as we know, the CBD is formed by the fusion of the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct. So now you're going to get blockage of both sides, not only the gallbladder, but also the liver. The backflow of bile in the liver leads to is known as cholestasis, and this can cause a rise in bilirubin and can make the patient jaundiced as well. Now, a progression of Charcot's triad or worsening of Charcot's triad is known as Reynolds Pentad, which includes the three we mentioned above, fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice, but also altered mental, mental state as well as hypertension. In essence, they're very septic, they're very sick, and this needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Both Charcot's triad and Reynolds Pentad require um, aggressive fluid resuscitation and just general resuscitation. When we take bloods from the patient, we expect to see a raised inflammatory marker because there's active inflammation or infection. So we should see a, a raised white blood cell count and a raised C-reactive protein, as well as some derangement in the LFTs, which includes a raised alanine transferase, raised um, aspartate transferase, a raised alkaline phosphatase, as well as an increased bilirubin too, as mentioned previously. Physically, we, ex we expect a tender right quadrant again, and sometimes even epigastric pain too. Now let's discuss gallstone pancreatitis. This occurs when the gallstone makes its way all the way down the tract to the furthest part of the CBD, 
where it meets the pancreatic duct, as we discussed previously in the anatomy slide, often near the ampulla lumbata. This, causes, this subsequently causes the blockage of both the biliary tree, so the CBD, the cystic duct, the gallbladder, the common hepatic duct, as well as the pancreatic duct, leading to pancreatitis. Physically, we expect a patient to be in pain, of course, especially in the right upper quadrant, as well as the epigastric region, and they usually present with pain radiating towards the back, which is characteristic of pancreatitis. When we take bloods on this patient, we expect there to be a raised inflammatory marker, of course, because there's active inflammation, which includes a raised white blood cell count and a raised CRP. We expect deranged LFTs, so that includes the ALT being high, AST being high, ALP being raised, as well as the bilirubin. And most importantly, we should test for amylase and lipases in this patient too, to assess if there's uh, pancreatitis. So how can you diagnose a patient? We've discussed it on the previous slides. So initially, we should obviously take a, a very thorough detailed history, um, finding out exactly when the pain started, how often it occurs, where does the pain radiate to, etc. Uh, we should do a formal physical examination, feel for Murphy sign, tenderness in the right percussion epigastric region, etc. etc. And of course, look at the patient's vital signs. That's also important when you're assessing for sepsis. Should be looking for the temperature, the blood pressure, the saturations, the heart rate, and the respiratory rate. Moving forward, the next step would be taking bloods. And as mentioned earlier, again, we should be taking, um, as well as the standard use and ease, FBC, CRP, et cetera, we should be taking LFTs too, and amylase and lipase if you're considering any pancreatitis involvement. Looking at imaging now, imaging is the gold standard form of diagnosing any of these biliary tree uh, pathologies. The first line imaging modality includes an ultrasound scan. The reason for that is because it's cheap, it's non-invasive, easy to get to and easy to get done. There's no radiation, etc., etc., and it also can find stones. A CT scan can be done, but often um, a CT scan cannot find stones, which is why ultrasound is preferred. But a CT scan can also be performed in cases where there is a, you know, uncertainty in the diagnosis. For example, if you're considering any hepatic abscesses, et cetera, et cetera. The gold standard, however, is the MRI scan, an MRCP. But that is rather um, expensive. It's not very easy to get hold of um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, there is some radiation involved. So let's talk about the ultrasound scan. So what do we look out for in an ultrasound? Specifically, we look out for gallstones. That's very important. You need to, you need to have a diagnosis of gallstones to have you know, gallstone pathologies. So gallstones is the most important thing. The size and number. The reason for that is because if there is a large size gallstone, greater than 2.5 centimeters, there are you know, far worse complications, which we won't discuss in this lecture, but um, you know, large gallstones can lead to other, other complications. For example, gallstone ileus, which we won't discuss in this topic, in this, in this presentation. Other things we look out for an ultrasound scan includes the gallbladder wall thickness. So how thick the wall is. Um, the thicker the wall is, uh, the more inflammation, the more infection that's on, ongoing within the gallbladder. Um, hence why we look out for that. <clears throat> we also look out for signs for any pericholecystic fluid, as that indicates inflammation, ongoing inflammation, as well as something known as sludge, as, the, as that indicates that there's a stone present there. And lastly, we look out for the CBD diameter, the common bile duct diameter. The normal diameter is between three and seven millimeters. Anything greater than seven may indicate a blockage of the CBD, either caused by a stone or a mass. Often on an ultrasound scan, we can't see stones of the CBD. We can only see stones uh, within the gallbladder. Hence why we'll discuss the, um, you know, the further diagnostic tools we'll need to actually diagnose stones in the CBD later. <clears throat> So as mentioned, the CT scan can also be used, however, an ultrasound is preferred. Um, it's a preferred imaging modality. Uh, the reason we mentioned earlier is because CT scans cannot find radiolucent stones, uh, therefore ultrasound scan is preferred. And also, um, you do a CT scan if, if, if there's any doubt of the diagnosis, for example, perforation, hepatic abscesses, and so forth. Moving on to the gold standard, the MRI scan, um, otherwise known as MRCP in this specific case. So what does an MRCP stand for? The MRCP stands for a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. In essence, it uses MRI 
in order to assess the biliary tree. Okay, so following an ultrasound scan, we may or may not perform an MRCP, and there are indications to perform the MRCP and indication, and, and there are some there are reasons why you shouldn't perform an MRCP, and we'll discuss that further in a second. For example, if the ultrasound scan shows that there are gallstones in the gallbladder, but there's a normal CVD, providing the bilirubin is also normal, we're not really expecting any stones in the CVD for two reasons. The CVD is normal diameter, obviously there's no stone, well, probably there's no stone, and also the bilirubin is not raised, so there's no backflow of bile affecting the liver. Therefore, we wouldn't really, this wouldn't really indicate performing an MRI scan or an MRCP. However, if the ultrasound scan showed that there are gallstones in the gallbladder and there is a dilated CBD, then we're thinking perhaps there's a stone there. Also, if the bilirubin is raised too, that's another reason for us to you know, think that there is a stone there. This would be an indication to perform the MRCP. The reason for that is we need to prove that there are introductal calculi that there are stones within the CBD. As mentioned earlier, MRCP is the gold standard for assessing inflammation of the gallbladder, assessing the CBD for stones or masses, and analyzing the anatomy of the biliary tree, which is important, highly important, prior to going in for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You wanna know the biliary tree very well before you go inside and operate, so you're not left stunned in essence. So this is, an, this is basically an overview of uh, what we've discussed earlier. So on the top, you can see the different pathologies, biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, ascending cholecystitis, and gallstone pancreatitis. On the left, you can see the different imaging modalities, which includes the ultrasound scan, the CT, and the MRCP. Feel free to pause the video here and run through this, um, this grid, as it gives you a fairly good overview of what you should be expected to see um, within these imaging modalities once when you have any of these uh, pathologies. <coughs> So how can you treat a biliary colic? Let's talk about treatment for all of these pathologies now, specifically a biliary colic. Now, as we know, biliary colic isn't, um, isn't you know, acute in essence. It's, it's not something we don't need to treat immediately. Um, the pain comes and goes in waves, as we know. Um, they're not infected. They're otherwise well in themselves, apart from this pain that, they come, that they're getting on the odd occasion following meals. <clears throat> so what do we do here? So the best... The best approach for biliary colic is to treat the patient um, um, conservatively with some adequate, adequate pain relief uh, to discharge them and to book them in for an elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which can occur in three to six months. Uh, there is no immediate uh, concerns for the patient's health at this point in time, hence why we do it electively rather than emergently. The treatment for acute cholecystitis, which as I mentioned is now the inflammation of the gallbladder and there is active infection going on. So initially we manage the patient with IV fluids, IV analgesia, IV antiemetics, and IV antibiotics to clear the infection. Acute cholecystitis is known as hot gallbladders in essence. Um, and according to the August guidelines, the patient should be operated on within 72 hours. Hence why we keep the patient, we admit the patient and we perform a laparoscopic cholecystectomy as soon as possible within 72 hours to hit the guidelines. If the patient is rather old and frail, <clears throat> they might not be fit for surgery, in which case we might then consider um, a percutaneous cholecystostomy, which in essence is um, a drain that they stick into the gallbladder via interventional radiology. <clears throat> so the treatment of ascending cholangitis and gallstone pancreatitis is rather similar. So when a patient presents and uh, we're we're clinically, um, you know, we're pretty certain that the patient has ascending cholangitis or gallstone pancreatitis based on, you know, physical examination, bloods and imaging. Um, the first thing we do is admit the patient because of course you can get severe form of sepsis in, in, in these two conditions. So we admit them for IV fluids, IV analgesia, IV antimetics and IV antibiotics. Due to the CB, CBD stone causing acute cholangitis or pancreatitis, the patient requires an ERCP to clear the ducts first before we can go in for an operation. So what is an ERCP? An ERCP is known as an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. This is an imaging as well as treatment uh, option for the patient. What, do, what they do in ERCP is they, they insert an endoscope in through the mouth and they go in through the gut and they go towards the, um, 
the ampulla vata, they go towards the major papilla. They open up the sphincter, which is known as sphincter of OD, and then they clear the ducts, they clear the CBD from the stones. They pluck, away, pluck it away and take it away. Now, once the CBD is entirely clear of stones, we then can go in as surgeons and then perform a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So it's important to keep the patient in following the ERCP and to perform the laparoscopic cholecystectomy once the CBD is clear. Now, our final slide gives a nice overview of everything we've discussed thus far. So feel free to pause this slide here and look at this um, grid in, in order to get a good overview of everything we've discussed. But in essence, it discusses all of the pathologies, biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, cholangitis, and gallstone and pancreatitis, what we do, the physical examination and what we expect to find, the bloods and what we expect to find, the imaging modalities and what the imaging will show, followed by the management of the patient. I hope this lecture was helpful to you all and uh, feel free to leave us feedback which will be attached on uh, during which will be attached on and given to you during our teaching sessions. Thank you very much.